All right. Well, good morning, everyone. It is uh, good to be with you today. Today we're reading Daniel chapter 10. And uh, so it's fascinating, isn't it, to uh, to read and to learn about these exiles, you know, these people who who they remain godly and they remain focused in on, on following God um, in the midst of an ungodly culture. So think about it. You know, here Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and, and some others, a, a remnant of believers um, in the one true God, they're, they're taken to Babylon, and, you know, they stay faithful. And it just, it reminds me a little bit of, of this, <clears throat> this reality of the culture and, the, and the, the community that we live in. You know, we don't, we're not in Jerusalem. If you were to kind of imagine if, you know, in, in our world, if whatever it was depicted as, as either being in Jerusalem, you know, a, a place where a culture and a community is based around belief and faith in God, you know, or Babylon, you know, a place with, you know, belief in, in multiple gods and, you know, just, uh, you know, an immoral, <clears throat> an immoral nation. We're not, we're not in, in Jerusalem anymore. You know, not that our nation was ever perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but, you know, we did have some some underpinnings as a, you know, as a culture. You know, there was, we don't even remember the time when, you know, a long time ago, uh, we actually lived in a culture where people didn't even work on Sunday, you know, that they that they blocked out time to worship God. I mean, that's such a, a distant memory for us that, you know, it's it's not only normal for now people to you know work on Sunday, but you know church now is is at and I believe is at a at a historic low when it comes to attendance. You know, and you know people not attending, and and that just that's just one thing um, that shows you know the you know, not only do people not work, literally you know everything was shut down. Why? Because people believed in rest. They believed in a day of a Sabbath. Even if if everybody didn't participate as a culture, we were there. You know, as a culture, we believed in morality. As a culture, we were we were much more aligned with biblical principles. You know, a hundred years ago, or at least seventy five years ago, than what we are today. We have we have cast off all of those things. And so we are much more now as a culture, we we behave much more like a Babylon than what we ever, you know, than than what we do Jerusalem. You know, and so the question is, do what what kind of people are we going to be in the midst of in the midst of Babylon? Are we going to be faithful? Are we going to base our lives and raise our children and raise our grandchildren? based upon the morals of the Bible, based upon the morals of, you know, Judeo-Christian beliefs, or are we going to be like the rest of the pagan society that continues to slide further and further away from God, you know, and allowing um, more and more things that are ungodly um, to, to influence our lives? And hopefully, hopefully we, we don't do that, you know, because there will be a time God is going to come back he is going to come back. He's going to return. And don't don't just dismiss that, you know, that like some who dismiss the reality that the Messiah was ever going to show up. I think that was part of the reason why so many people missed the Messiah was because they just got used to living with without, you know, with, without the presence of the Messiah and the promised Messiah. They were like, oh, yeah, it's, it's going to come. Sure it is. And, and so they they weren't prepared we're supposed to be prepared for the second coming of Christ. He is coming. It's been, listen, friends, it's been 2,000 years, 2,000 years since Jesus, you know, walked the face of the earth, gave his life as a ransom for humanity. And it had been 2,000 years prior to that, that, uh, you know, that the prophets had, had prophesied that the Messiah was going to come, you know, and so, you know, we're, we're it's time. It's time for the Messiah to come back and um, um, to uh, to bring, a, you know, judgment to this world. And one of the things that we see that is a sign that judge that the that the return is going to come is the love of most will grow cold. If you look at Matthew 24 and you look at the signs of when the when when uh, the Messiah returns, 
Um, Matthew 24 gives a number of the, the you know, the prof- prophecies of, of what's it going to look like? What's the day and age it's going to look like? And a brother's going to turn against brother and a child against parent. And look at what we have. I mean, children who are, are completely turning against their parents, throwing off any kind of authority figure in their life. The love of most is growing cold. You know, um, we are now calling evil good and calling good things evil. And it's just everything is backwards. And, and it's in those days when the Messiah will be returning because the darkness will be flooding the face of the earth. And we are in dark, dark dark days as a culture and um, not only in just what everybody individually is accepting but even what we're legislating we're legislating immorality now and not only that what's interesting is is um, america has greatly influenced the rest of the world in its immorality Uh, because america is such a an integral part of the rest of the the world um, we're so tied together economically, and we, what we have produced in Hollywood goes out all throughout the rest of the world. And what Hollywood is producing that makes things look normal, quite honestly, is, is, is pretty atrocious. You know, and so we need to consider that. And Daniel speaks of these, some of these realities that will come to bear. And uh, so today we're uh, Daniel chapter 10. Let's jump in. It says, in the third year of, king, of Cyrus, the king of Persia, a revelation was given to Daniel, who was called Belteshazzar. Its message was true, and it concerned a great war. <clears throat> the understanding of the message came to him in a vision. At that time, I, Daniel, mourned for three weeks. That's a pretty powerful and, and um, earth-shaking vision to have when he mourned for three weeks. He said, I ate no choice food, no meat or wine touched my lips, <clears throat> and I used no lotions at all until the three weeks were over. On the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the great on the bank of the great river, the Tigris, I looked up and there before me was a man dressed in linen with a belt of fine gold from, uh, from Euphaz around his waist. His body was like topaz, his face was like lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and his voice like the sound of a multitude. I, Daniel, was the only one who saw the vision, those who were with me did not see it, but such terror overwhelmed me, overwhelmed them that they fled and hid themselves. So I was alone, gazing at this great vision. I had no strength left. My face turned deathly pale, and I was helpless. Then I heard him speaking, and as I listened to him, I fell into a deep sleep, my face <clears throat> to the ground. A hand touched me and sent me, set me trembling on my hands and knees. And he said, Daniel, you who are highly esteemed, consider carefully the words I am about to speak to you and stand up. For I have now been sent to you. And when he said this to me, I stood up trembling. <clears throat> then he continued, do not be afraid, Daniel, since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, Your words were heard, and I have come in response to them. But the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. And then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. Now I have come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the future, for the vision concerns a time yet to come. While he was... Saying this to me, I bowed with my face toward the ground and was speechless. Then one who looked like a man touched my lips, and I opened my mouth and began to speak. And I said to the one standing before me, I am overcome with anguish because of the vision, the vision, my Lord, and I feel very weak. How can I, your servant, talk with you, my Lord? My strength is gone, and I can hardly breathe. Again, the one who looked like a man touched me and gave me strength. Do not be afraid, you who are highly esteemed, he said. Peace, be strong now, be strong. When he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, Speak, my Lord, since you have given me strength. So he said, Do you know why I have come to you? Soon I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. 
And when I go, the Prince of Greece will come. But first I will tell you what is written in the book of truth. No one supports me against them except Michael, your prince. And in the first year of Darius the Mede, I took my stand to support and protect him. <clears throat> now then, I tell you the truth. Three more kings will arise in Persia, and then a fourth who will be far richer than all the others. When he has gained power by his wealth, he will stir up everyone against the kingdom of Greece. Then a mighty king will arise who will rule with great power and do as he pleases. After he has arisen, his empire will be broken up and parceled out toward the four winds of the earth, the heaven. It will not go to his descendants, nor will it have the power he exercised because his empire will be uprooted and given to others. The king of the south will become strong, but one of his commanders will become even stronger than he and will rule over his own kingdom with great power. After some years, they will become allies the daughter of the king of the south will go to the king of the north to make an alliance, but she will not retain her power, and he and his power will not last. In those days, she will be betrayed together with her royal escort and her father and the one who supported her. One from her family line will arise to take her place. He will attack the forces of the king of the north and enter his fortress. He will fight against them and be victorious. He will also seize their gods, their metal images, and their valuable articles of silver and gold and carry them off to Egypt. For some years, he will leave the king of the north alone. Then the king of the north will invade the realm of the king of the south, but will retreat to his own country. His sons will prepare for war and assemble a great army, which will sweep on like an irresistible flood and carry the battle as far as his fortress. <clears throat> then the king of the south will march out in a rage and fight against the king of the north, who will raise a large army, but it will be defeated. When the army is carried off, the king of the south will be filled with pride and will slaughter many thousands, yet he will not remain triumphant. For the king of the north will muster another army larger than the first, and after several, several years, he will advance with a huge army fully equipped. And in those times, many will rise against the king of the south. Those who are violent among your own people will rebel in fulfillment of the vision, but without success. Then the king of the north will come and build up siege ramps and will capture a fortified city. The forces of the south will be powerless to resist. Even their best troops will not have the strength to stand. The invader will do as he pleases. No one will be able to stand against him. He will establish his, himself in the beautiful land and will have the power to destroy it. He will determine to come with the might of his entire kingdom and will make an alliance with the king of the south and he will give him a daughter in marriage in order to overthrow the kingdom. But his plans will not succeed or help him. Then he will turn his attention to the coastlands and will take many of them. But a commander will put an end to his insolence, and he will turn his insolence back on him. After this, he will turn back toward the fortresses of his own country, but will stumble and fall to be seen no more. His successor will send out a tax collector to maintain the royal splendor, in a few years, however, he will be destroyed, yet not in anger or in battle. He will be succeeded by a contemptible person who has not been given the honor of royalty. He will invade the kingdom when its people feel secure, and he will seize it through intrigue. Then an overwhelming army will be swept away before him. Both it and a prince of the covenant will be destroyed. After coming to an agreement with him, he will act deceitfully. And with only a few people, he will rise to power. When the richest provinces feel secure, he will invade them and will achieve what neither his fathers nor his forefathers did. He will distribute plunder, loot, and wealth among his followers. He will plot the overthrow of fortresses, but only for a time. And with a large army, he will stir up his strength and courage against the king of the south. The king of the south will wage war with a large and very powerful army but he will not be able to stand against the plots devised against him. Those who eat from the king's provisions will try to destroy him. His army will be swept away and many will fall in battle. The two kings with their hearts bent on evil will sit at the same table and lie to each other, but to no avail because an end will come, will still come at the appointed time. The king of the north will return to his own country with great wealth, but his heart will be set against the holy covenant. He will take action against it and then return to his own country. 
And at the appointed time, he will invade the south again. But this time, the outcome will be different from what it was before. Ships of the western coastlands will oppose him, and he will lose heart. Then he will turn back and vent his fury against the Holy Covenant. He will return and show favor to those who forsake the Holy Covenant. His armed forces will rise up to desecrate the temple fortress and will abolish the daily sacrifice. Then they will set up the abomination that causes desolation. With flattery, he will corrupt those who have violated the covenant, but the people who know their God will firmly resist him. Those who are wise will instruct many, though for a time they will fall by the sword or be burned or captured or plundered. When they fall, they will receive a little help and many who are not sincere will join them. Some of the wise will stumble so that they may be refined, purified, and made spotless until the time of the end, for it will still come at the appointed time. The king will do as he pleases. He will exalt and magnify himself above every god and will say unheard of things against the god of gods. He will be successful until the time of wrath is completed, for what has been determined must take place. He will show no regard for the gods of his ancestors or for the one who desired the one desired by women nor will he regard any god but will exalt himself above them all instead of them he will honor a god of fortresses a god unknown to his ancestors he will honor with sil- with gold and silver with precious stones and costly gifts he will attack the mightiest fortresses with the help of a foreign god and he will greatly honor those who acknowledged him he will make them rule rulers over many people and would distribute the land at a price at the time of the end of the king of the south will engage him in battle and the king of the north will storm out against him with chariots and cavalry and a great fleet of ships he will invade many countries and sweep through them like a flood he will also invade the beautiful land many countries will fall but edom moab and the leaders of ammon will be delivered from his hand He will extend his power over many countries. Egypt will not escape. He will gain control of the treasures of gold and silver and all the riches of Egypt with the Libyans and Cushites in submission. But reports from the east and the north will alarm him, and he will set out in a great rage to destroy and annihilate many. He will pitch his royal tents between the seas at the beautiful holy mountain. Yet he will come to his end and no one will help him. Chapter 12, and at that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people will arise. There will be a time of distress, such as had not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise, will shine like the brightness of the heavens and those who who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, roll up and seal the words of the scroll until the time of the end. Many will go here and there to increase knowledge. Then I, Daniel, looked and there before me stood two others, one on this bank of the river and one on the opposite bank. One of them said to the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river, how long will it be before these astonishing things are fulfilled. The man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river lifted his right hand and his left hand toward heaven. And I heard him swear by him who lives forever saying, it will be for a time, times and a half a time. And when the power of the holy people have, has been finally broken, all these things will be completed. I heard, but I did not understand. So I asked my Lord, what will the outcome of all this be? And he replied, Go on your way, Daniel, because the words are rolled up and sealed until the time of the end. Many will be purified, made spotless and refined, but the wicked will continue to be wicked. None of the wicked will understand, but those who are wise will understand. And from the time that the daily sacrifice is abolished and the abomination that causes desolation is set up, there will be 1,290 days. Blessed is the one who waits for and reaches the end of the 1,335 days. As for you, go your way till the end. You will rest. And then at the end of the days, you will rise to receive your allotted inheritance. 
All right, so we have finished up the book of Daniel, and we see an apocalyptic glimpse of not only the future for uh, the Jewish people, but for humanity itself. And um, that is where we see, you know, when, when you read Daniel chapters 10 through 12, you're seeing um, some, some very, um, you know, very important uh, prophetic words being spoken, a vision, if you will, from, um, you know, between Daniel and um, Michael, the, uh, the archangel. And um, we, we see, you know, a very clear message being given. You know, and so I marked in, in, in chapter 12, there's, there's a number of things in here, um, but we see, we see major vying for power between nations. Um, and we see one who is the, you know, the tool of the enemy that is rising up to, um, to attack. And in chapter 12, it says, you know, the, the, at that time, Michael, uh, and they call him the great prince, right? Uh, who protects your people will arise and there will be a time of distress such as has not happened from the beginning of nations until then. And so we are headed towards a time of distress that will have been the most difficult and stressful um, of any time, and you think about all of the times of great stress, what they have been like, what what that is that we will, as a people on the face of the earth, what we will be facing. And it says, but at that time, your people, and again, he's talking to Daniel, he's talking about the Jewish people, your, <clears throat> those who are under the covenant, all the way following up through the Messiah. Um, at those times, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book uh, will be delivered. You know, and so God is going to to deliver those who are who are followers, who are of the covenant. You know, and obviously we we have the the new covenant through the blood of Jesus. So, so thankfully, that means you and me and those whose names are written in the book of life. And um, if you are a um, follower of Christ, um, bought by the blood, um, surrendered life somebody who just fakes it, but somebody who truly is under covenant with God, uh, you'll be saved through that. You'll be delivered. And, uh, and it's going to be a, a, a powerful moment. And uh, Daniel asks, how long will it take, you know, before these astonishing events? And he gives a time, uh, times and a half a time. And when the power of the holy people has been finally broken and, and all of these things will be complete. And he says, I, I don't understand. And so verse eight, he says, I heard, but I did not understand. And some people try to put together a really strong, powerful, you know, uh, systematic theology when it comes to their, their end times and have everything completely mapped out. And, and I think there's a part of us that, that we, you know, Daniel, he's given great wisdom, right? He's one of the wisest people that's, uh, you know, on the face of the earth at that time, God gave him ability to not only, um, you know, interpret dreams and visions, but to be able to tell kings what the dream was that they dreamed, you know? And so, I mean, God, God has given Daniel great wisdom. And yet Daniel even says, I don't understand. I don't understand. And, uh, and so I think it's important for us to understand that uh, we aren't necessarily supposed to understand all of it. We, we do need to know that the Messiah is coming back and that, you know, look for the signs of these things uh, that will happen, but, you know, we aren't going to completely understand every, you know, like all of the details. Um, some of those things uh, we just, you know, we're not going to be able to uh, to fully understand, but God has given the vision, obviously, for us to be prepared and for us to be ready and for us to be watching and for us to make sure that we are living under the, the great commission that Jesus gave us, right? Jesus gave the great commission because from Daniel, we see all the way fast forward to the Messiah, right? The Messiah coming and then Jesus came and then he gave us the great commission. And, you know, and, and then his disciples asked him, when are you going to return the kingdom to Israel? When are you going to do this? And Jesus said, it's not for you to know the times or the dates that my father is set by his own authority, but you will receive power 
when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the very ends of the earth. And in, they are given the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that you and I have. We possess this Holy Spirit. He, give us, he has given us the authority to go out and to preach the gospel. Not just a not just some some you know um, shallow gospel, but the gospel. Jesus is Lord. He is Savior. He has bought the nations with His blood for those who will who will uh, be grafted into this amazing covenant, the new covenant between us and Jesus, sealed by the blood of Jesus. We get to preach the gospel to all people and help them come out of darkness and into the light as we move towards the end and we're moving rapidly towards the end in this time when the Christ will come back and he will judge the nations. And, uh, and as we move towards the end, it's very clear that the scriptures teach that things will get darker and darker and harder and harder. And so even as we experience harder things and darker things and, nations rising up against nation and great wars and, and and difficulties that come upon the face of the earth because man is evil it's just a sign that Jesus we're that much closer to when Jesus comes back and he, he he's not going to come back as a lamb this time he's going to come back as a lion he's coming back not as the lamb of god but as the lion of the tribe of judah the one who, who will bring judgment and justice upon the face of the earth. And so that's coming. We're moving in that direction. But as we move in that direction, things are going to get harder and harder. That means that we have to be more and more in the word of God, faithful to God, casting off the things of this world, you know, and making sure that our hope is in God, our hope is in Jesus, that we don't live like the rest of the world, that we train ourselves to be godly, that we we say no to the world and yes to God, say no to the flesh and say yes to God, say no to all of the things that the world is chasing. You Listen, you're going to get, if you don't say no, you'll be sucked into all of the values of this world. And we see that happening all around us, you know, where we just, we live in a world of indulgence, indulge your own desires, indulge what you want. And we have to say no to those things and say yes to God. And we have to be willing to be, to stand out, to stand apart, to be different than everybody else. I mean, really different, really different. Don't operate the same way that they do. Don't talk the same way that they do live differently. They, the world wants to get more extravagant, get more simple. Focus in on your discipline with God so that you can be like a Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who, who, who are focused in so much in, in, with God that they don't even eat the same food. They, they, they're, going to, they're going to continue to, to strive after God and making sure that they are remaining holy in the midst of an unholy culture. That's us. And so God has called us to do that. And I want to encourage you, you're going to have to have strength to do this. You're going to have to walk in the spirit to do this. You're, you can't gratify the desires of the sinful nature anymore. we got to live like Paul, who says, who, who's in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. Are you crucified? I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. In the life I live in the body, I live by faith and the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And so we've got to live the crucified life. And see, the crucified life doesn't say yes to all of our flesh, all of the our desires, being authentically true to ourselves. No, being authentically true to ourselves as a Christian means I've been crucified. I've crucified myself. I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live all my fleshly desires. They, they're dead and I live for Christ. And when we live that way, we will live different. We will live a life that is markedly different than the rest of the world. And that is proved by our pursuits. Don't sacrifice your children in running after all of these things that the world is running after while, the hell, while, while hell is being unleashed upon the, the face of this earth. 
put God first, keep church first, keep youth group first, keep children's, you know, your children coming and learning the, the word of God. Keep that first because they, your children aren't secure if you don't keep them in the word of God and keep them following God. They'll be swept away by this world, just like this, kidnapped by the world and its values and its desires. So we've got to wage war and we've got to fight and we've got to, we've got to fight to keep our children and ourselves in, in, in walking in fellowship with God and living in righteousness and, and, and doing what we've got to do. Okay, so we've got to do this, folks. This is important. This is a matter of eternal eternity. Um, and so we know what's coming. So you've got to start being prepared. All right, let's go ahead to, uh, um, to Psalm 146. <clears throat> And I got a bit of a sermon today, but it's this is this is super important. We can't we can't live like the rest of the world and expect that we are going to be able to have then the discernment as to how to keep living, and you know how to, how to keep ourselves in the right path if we if we give in and we don't prepare ourselves. Psalm one forty six. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. Do not put your trust in princes in human beings who cannot save. When their spirit departs, they return to the ground. On that very day, their plans come to nothing. Blessed are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God. He is the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. He remains faithful forever. He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the foreigner and sustains the fatherless and the widow, but he frustrates the ways of the wicked. The Lord reigns forever. Your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord. I think that's a really fitting song for us, right? Do not trust in princes, <laughs> you know, presidents. Rulers over this world, do not trust in them. That's what he says. Do not put your trust in princes, in human beings who cannot save. They can't save us. They can't save us. They won't save us. For one, they're not walking with God. The majority of them, they cannot save us. Only God can. And when, there's, when they die, they return to the ground. Guess what? All of their plans, they're gone. And, and listen, the, the rest of the world just moves on to the next person and to the next person, and to the next person who makes promises, but they can't fulfill them. They can't save. They can't save us. They can't save this world. Only God can. And that's why if we don't return to God, the world's not going to be saved. And the world's far from turning back to God. And so we need to know where this world is going. God is the one who's the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in it. And he remains faithful forever. And so that at, at the end there, look what he says. Uh, he, he, Lord lifts up those who are bowed down, right? Humble yourself, therefore, under God, God's mighty hand that he might lift you up. That's what it's saying. It, those, he, the Lord lifts up those who are bowed down, those who humble themselves. We live in a world with pride. And you think about it, gay pride. We have pride, people walking around, puffed up about themselves. <laughs> That's sin. Pride goes before the fall, especially when we're pri proud about our sin. The Lord despises the proud, opposes. The scripture says God opposes the proud, but gives strength to the humble. So we've got to humble ourselves before God. Stop walking around peacock-like and walking around puffing ourselves up. We have to humble ourselves under God's mighty hand, and he will lift us up. He lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. He loves the righteous. He loves those who are walking in righteousness. And if you want to know what righteousness looks like, take a look at the, at the Beatitudes, you know, in, where God says, you know, he, he blesses those who are righteous, you know. And so it, it's, it's those who are meek, those who are humble, those who are hunger and thirst after righteousness for his name's sake, those who are peacemakers in the midst of a, a world that's warring against one another. Those who are loving, uh, truly loving one another, not harboring bitterness and unforgiveness in our hearts. Those who are, 
who are who are um, walking in righteous ways, right? In uh, meek, following after God. That's what me, you know meekness is. It's not weakness. It's following after God. It's understanding. I live under the authority of God, not the authority of man. Uh, the authority of man with all of our man-made rules that are, listen, so many of them now are so unrighteous and just sets up for those who are in power. Um, you know, we, we're denigrating, you know, we're, we're you know, definitely, definitely um, devolving, if you will. We're not evolving into a higher species. We're devolving into sin, plunging into darkness. And so we need to follow, you know, follow the Lord. And the Lord watches over, you know, watches over us and uh, he will continue to frustrate the wicked. All right. Well, let's pray together. Oh, you got a lot of preaching today. So um, important messages, important for us to hear these things. Father, I just pray that today that you would be with us. God, that we will walk in following you. Lord, that we will not walk in our own ways, that we will that we will understand that we are living in the midst of a dark, dark uh, day, a culture, God, that is moving towards the setting up the um, the abomination that causes desolation. That we are we are in a day and an age when when wickedness and and uh, evil is waging war against goodness, waging war against righteousness. That even even the those in dark places, God those who are in authority powers in this wicked world and spirit in in the dark powers of the of the uh, evil realm um, god are are in uh, working together to bring darkness upon the face of the earth when demons are teaching people and people are following the ways of demons things taught by demons themselves and Lord, we pray that you would help us to be a people who are immersed in your word, that we are immersed in the body of Christ, that we are, that we are doing all we can to, to um, crucify the sinful nature, crucify the old self, and to come alive in Christ. Lord, that we would follow the example of, of the great men um, and women of God um, from old. God, that we would follow in the path of a Daniel who lived in the midst of a pagan and a, uh, a warring nation, God. And even, even as they lived there, you elevated them. You elevated Daniel to places of influence, but he was faithful to continue to pray, faithful to continue to follow you and humble himself and listen to you. And he didn't allow his elevation, God, to impact him. And Lord, I pray that you would help us all to um, who are who are reading this together today? That that no matter what status that we have been elevated to, that we would not uh, be sucked into the ways of this world. That we would um, have postured our hearts and our minds and our lives in such a way that we will live for you and not give in to the temptations all around us that pull us to live like the world, to have values like the world. But God, we want to follow you. So, Father, I pray. Lord, that you would, for each one who's reading with me today, God, may they, may they heed the importance of this message. May they heed the importance of today's reading and, and, and see and understand where it is that we're heading. And God, the need that they and their families need to have to, uh, to, to really immerse themselves in your word and immerse themselves in a culture and around people who are going to hold them accountable and going to encourage them to stay true and stay fast towards you because because this world is turning darker and darker. So Lord, help us to lean on you, to walk in the spirit, to lean on one another, to stay faithful, to strip the things in our lives away that need to be stripped, that we would die to ourselves and that we would do the opposite of what the world is doing. Father, we know that as we do that, God, you will remain faithful to your righteous. You will remain faithful. You will lead us, you will protect us, you will guide us. God, in the midst of a culture that is imploding under the weight of sin. So, Lord, help us to remain faithful. Thank you, God. May your blessing rest on each one, Lord, as they go throughout the rest of this day. May these words echo in their heart and in their mind the rest of this day and in the weeks to come. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 
All right. Well, thank you again so much for, uh, for joining me. God bless you as you go throughout the rest of this day. Seek God. Seek him. Seek him. Die to yourself. Come alive in Christ. Live the righteous life that you've been called to live, and God will bless you and guide you. Have a great day.